Um, welcome. I'm Patricia Kranz. I'm the executive director of the Overseas Press Club. We're delighted to welcome Dean Yates, Mary Binks, and Clotid Redburn to discuss how journalists can recognize PTSD in themselves, their colleagues, or their loved ones, and some ideas of methods they could use to cope with it. And we'll do that by focusing on Dean's book, Line in the Sand, a memoir published in June. Dean was uh, brought to the brink of suicide by extreme workplace trauma, but recovered because of a strong drive to get better, the human connection of his loving family, especially his life partner, Mary, who's with us, and a mental health system that worked. Dean and Mary will talk with Clotilde Redburn, director of the Rory Peck Trust, a UK charity dedicated to the support, safety, and welfare of journalists. Dean was a journalist and bureau chief at Reuters for 26 years. He led teams of journalists that covered the Bali bombings, the Boxing Day tsunami in Indonesia, and the Iraq war. He was bureau chief in Iraq when a US Apache gunship killed two Reuters journalists in Baghdad in 2007. Dean's last role at Reuters was to create and roll out a mental health strategy for the company's 2,500 journalists from 2017 to 2020. Mary Binks, Dean's partner of 28 years, worked as a print, radio, and television journalist in Australia and Asia for two decades. Among other things, she reported on Hong Kong's handover to China for Time Magazine in 1997 and was a roving TV producer for Reuters Television, covering the downfall of Indonesian President Suharto in 1998. Mary took 13 years off to raise their three children, then retrained and returned to the workforce as a trauma counselor to refugees and asylum seekers. She's currently a support worker at a homeless shelter. So please put any questions you have in the chat at any time. And we look forward to a lot of discussion. I now turn it over to Chloe Tilden. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Patricia. I was delighted to be invited to have this, my first conversation, live conversation with Dean Yates and to meet his wife, Mary Binks. Mary um, is definitely a really big presence in Dean Yates's memoir. She comes across in the book as a, a definite shining light. So it's a real treat, I think, for everyone tuning in to be able to speak to both of you together this evening. And I understand that this is the first time you've spoken together about this book and about your experience of PTSD. That's right, um, Latil, so it's a bit of an exclusive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it's worthwhile just talking about why, we, we touched on this very briefly, but why you wanted to do this together. Yeah, I think it's important that uh, as, as uh, a couple uh, that we're able to share our experiences of what it was like for the whole family. Uh, to go through what what the whole family has gone through. I, I mean, I, I write uh, very intimately about the experiences of, of PTSD from my perspective, and also write about it from from my family's perspective. But then it's in my words, and so I think it's it's really important that that people get to hear what it was like from from Mary's perspective in her words. I, I just don't think you can understate the importance of that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Mary, what made you want to join Dean for the first time to talk about this together? I think it's um, very important um, to hear a partner's perspective, um, another journalist as well, um, because I have seen the, the pressures that um, journalists are under, the, the level of trauma, the um, marriage breakups, the um, alcohol and drug dependency, and I'm not saying that that characterizes journalism, but um, it, it, it's a it can be a very traumatic area to work in. So there are lots of pressures. You travel a lot, um, and PTSD. I think at the time when Dean uh, was diagnosed, wasn't something that people were 
um, it was a term that we weren't really very familiar with. In fact, the, I mean, the, the funny the funny thing was 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 when I was first posted to Baghdad, for example, as the bureau chief in in uh, when I first got the job in two thousand and six, Mary and I had long conversations about that role, and we talked about the physical safety for myself. We talked about the pressures I would be under. We talked about the dangers to my staff and all this sort of thing. We had long conversations about the risks. We never once talked about the psychological risk to myself. That's that gives you a sense of how limited the knowledge of PTSD was back then, uh, which I think you know is quite is quite is, is quite shocking in a way. It's good to be reminded of the context that you went out, you were existing in and working in when you took on that job, because I'm sure you were expecting it to be risky. I'm sure you were expecting it to be difficult. I'm sure you justified it to yourselves because your career was to cover what was going on. And of course, a lot of, you know, you'd made your career covering um, conflicts and trying to make sense of them for the world. And that's what a lot of journalists feel is the is the is where the real meat of the job is when you're covering history unfolding. Now, I, I think it's really interesting that you mentioned you looked into the physical risks and maybe the risks to your personal safety, your family's safety, the responsibilities you will have had for risk management of the whole bureau. Interestingly, the Rory Pack Trust is, was created to help freelance journalists manage risks. And nearly that twin, it was create, launched in 95, so nearly 30 years ago. And back then, the concern was primarily physical safety. How do you measure your physical safety? How to do a proper risk assessment? How to prepare for operating in a hostile environment or a conflict zone? It was all to, you know, to boil it down. Yep. How do you avoid bleeding out if you're shot? <laughs> right. How do you know where to be where to be safe in a war zone? That kind of thing. And then, of course, very quickly with the development of um, technology, people understood very quickly that digital security had to go hand in hand with physical risk assessments. You couldn't be physically safe if you weren't digitally secure because having a weakness on the digital security front would give away your location, et cetera, et cetera, and mm -hmm. vice versa. And so there's been a joint focus at the trust in our focus on safety for journalists. And then, so two years ago, we, we've been running support funds for journalists for many years, and, and we noticed about two to three years ago that an increasing amount of requests to our crisis funds were actually from journalists asking for financial support to cover the costs of professional psychological support, the costs of trauma therapy. They just didn't know where to go. They don't want to quit. They want to talk to a clinician that understands journalists because Journal clinicians that don't understand journalism just think, well, you're mad, just stop your job. That's what's making you ill. Of course, that's the last thing you want to do if your whole life's purpose is to work in a traumatic environment. Even um, journalists that are exposed to vicarious trauma, those who are editing live footage back in the safety of a HQ in London or New York, they can experience real um, vicarious trauma as a result of being repeatedly exposed to content. And they find it really difficult to handle that because it seems unacceptable to admit that you might need help when you're in the safety of the edit room. But all of this is, is um, coming out now. And what I'm finding really interesting is there is definitely more talk about psychological safety. I just heard from Patricia that they've been holding more webinars for the OPC about psychological safety, which is great. Two years ago at the Rory Peck Trust, we launched what we called a resilience program where we, um, we partnered with the DART Center on Trauma and Journalism to give journalists lots of training on trauma-aware journalism, covering both sides of what trauma-aware journalism is, which is how do you interview traumatized victims in a sensitive way? But also how do you spot any trauma you may be carrying as a result of your repeated exposure to traumatic events? And because you can't be the best journalist you can be without managing your own health, be that physical mm. and mental, et cetera. Um, so I think the psychological side is actually absolutely intertwined with the physical risk assessment and the digital security. And of course, now with the growing legal attacks that are being um, the growing use of um, 
people weaponizing the war against journalists, mm -hmm. legal risk awareness is coming into play as well. Now, what's I think really key to our discussion tonight is the fact that the psychological safety or the psychological health of journalists impacts so much on their loved ones and their families. And as Mary said, there is an undeniable impact on the partners of the patient, PTSD patients or anyone really um, struggling with trauma. It definitely bleeds over into your personal relationships. And we know from many um, scientists research, including Anthony Feinstein, that one of the key protectors of psychological um, damage and trauma is strong familial bonds. So I would really like to ask you, Dean, when you, you say, you know, in the introduction, Patricia was saying you had a drive to get better. Where, when did you know you weren't well and what made you gave you that drive to get better well actually to be honest with you uh i was unwell for many years um i had a lot of the symptoms of ptsd the classic symptoms of ptsd the emotional numbness um the flashbacks uh and i was suffering my family was suffering but i was in denial about that and mary was trying to make it clear to me that I was struggling and that I needed help, but I refused to believe it. And one of the reasons that I refused to believe that there was anything wrong with me was that I could still do my job. I was still managing to, to work and to do and to perform well. And, and this is one of the, this is one of the things about PTSD is that people can compartmentalize their personal life and their work life. And, and, and this went on for years and I, I was just, I was fortunate that Mary never gave up trying to get me to seek help. And it got to a point where in 2016, I was so unwell that um, Mary was able to, I guess, convince me that the time had come that I needed to see a psychiatrist and that uh, I literally got a diagnosis within 45 minutes. Uh, it was that clear that I had PTSD. And that was a bit of a, that, I wouldn't call it a turning point because there was still a long road ahead in terms of um, coming to an emotional acceptance that I had PTSD. And I still had to go through, I, I guess, an acceptance of the diagnosis and then um, fully accept that I had that condition and, and get to a point where I mean, I, I unraveled further, but once I, once I got to that emotional acceptance that I had PTSD, then I thought this is, this is a, this is almost, it was almost like a story that I had to understand. And this was going to be the biggest story of my life. And I thought I'm going to throw the kitchen sink at it. Like any journalist would, I'm going to absolutely throw everything I've got, to, I've got at it, understand it, confront it and work out what it is I've got to do to get on top of it. And that was the obsession that I brought to it to work out what it was. And at the same time, I just had Mary and my kids giving me all the support that I needed to, uh, to, to battle it. So Mary, from what Dean's just said, it sounds like you knew before he did, long before he did, that he needed help and that you could not offer the professional support that he needed. He was gonna need to see a, a, a clinician. When yeah. what were the signs for you that made it clear to you that he needed help way before he he could fit and realize it? I think the only way, looking back, that Dean was able to cope with the trauma that he'd experienced was to become numb, not to show anything, any cracks in the facade. So in a way, he. I, he well he did isolate himself from the family from me um and was very much the sort of tough journalist and um at home of course we'd have we'd have great times you know we'd watch movies we'd laugh but there was certain territory that we didn't um traverse um but of course privately I was at my wits end because this person wasn't my husband and we we didn't know about trauma it's okay to talk about ptsd but you have to understand trauma and yeah. 
Um, I think trauma maybe in our generation of journalists was considered a bit of a a, a weakness. Um, we we were tough, and you know you'd tell stories around, um, you know, over the bar or something of you know someone's latest you know, exploits and getting pictures and getting photos and getting stories. So I, I don't remember trauma ever being talked about. And then suddenly there's this diagnosis. Mm. And when, when I was at my wits end, I went to talk to a friend who's a psychologist and she said, um, Dean has, you know, um, PTSD. And I'd, I'd never really heard of it. Um, so I had a big job to... Um, to try and get Dean to understand. I mean, Dean, Dean is trying to preserve his sanity. Um, so he's moving away from us, whereas I'm sort of running after him saying, you have this condition, don't panic. Um, mm. You've been under a lot of trauma or you've faced a lot of trauma, you've experienced a lot of trauma. Your body is just telling you something. Um, I don't even think I was that articulate. Um and of course, you know, in self protection, I think Dean sort of thought, no, 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 I'm all right, I can cope. And so it took it took time, it took time. And if I could do it again, I'd do it better. You know, uh, I, I work in the area of trauma now, and the first the first thing you ever tell people is you're safe, you're safe. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not mad, you're not bad, you're safe. And um, I think the conversation is so much easier these days um, because journalism there then was was different you you did take risks and you didn't think about the actual um, psycholo psychological risks to yourself yeah I think one of the other things as well Patil was that I was we were living in Tasmania right mm. I mean how far away from a war zone could you get and so I'm I'm, I'm how could I be unwell so that that mm. that that helped mm. foster that denial that there could be anything wrong Mm. And it had been years since I'd been in a war zone. How could there be anything wrong? Mm. Yeah, you know the, I mean? pro the problem with PTSD is it's not logical, though, is it? And and exactly. it's this and it's this it's this delayed onset thing, which we didn't understand. We'd never heard of. And they could say I'm fine, but then someone would drop a cup or yeah. slam a door, or, or or Dean would have nightmares. You know. Yeah. Um, so you you know something's not right, but then the logic of it is, well, I'll get it better now because I'm, I'm away. A... I'm home. Yeah, right, yeah. I can get better. So when you're trying to help someone, it, it's very hard. You yeah. needed as many experts around you as you could, um, yeah. but there weren't many in Tasmania. No. Yeah. So, D Dean, the, the way you described it just then was that you didn't think there was anything wrong with you. And then Mary convinced you to go and see a psychiatrist. And within 45 minutes, they'd given you a diagnosis. So that yep. seems very quick, which suggests that they were pretty sure that yes. you presented all the signs. That must have been a sudden awakening for you. You did say you had to kind of emotionally come to terms with the with your diagnosis. It does. I've spoken to some people who sometimes, when they've had any diagnosis, feel a sense of relief that the diagnosis explains what hasn't made sense to them about themselves. Sure. Did, was there any of that, or was it? Were you just in denial? And because. The culture in journalism has changed a lot. I, I recognize what you and Mary are saying about the old fashioned culture that journalists are hard. We go into trouble when everyone else is running away from it. And, you know, journalists certainly do not identify themselves as traumatized people. In fact, um, in the resilience program, we launched a trauma therapy fund and we had to drop the word trauma because nobody applied. <laughs> And then we had yeah. to drop wow. the word therapy and we had to just call it professional psychological support because the the the, the sort of language had such yeah. weight and such kind yeah. of prejudice. You know, journalists aren't traumatized. It's the, the people we interview are traumatized. Yeah. They've had really traumatic lives. We're fine. We're like the lucky ones, you know. So and and I don't think there's there was certainly the culture of bravado the the bravado in journalism is is certainly a cultural thing and let's face it the culture of substance misuse and drink and yeah. you know knock, knocking it knocking it away with a couple of drinks at the end of the day kind of thing I definitely think yeah. things have changed now 
but I'm I mean, look, when I, got, when, I got the, when I got the diagnosis, intellectually, I understood it, but emotionally, I didn't accept it uh, at the time. And this was crucial. I, I only understood this later when I had my first psych ward admission. But when I got the diagnosis, I went on sick leave. And I just, I just didn't, um, when, I'm, when I say I didn't emotionally accept it, I didn't inquire into the diagnosis. I didn't read about it. I didn't, and I wasn't getting any, um, I was just seeing a psychiatrist once a month who didn't really get me. I wasn't getting any actual therapy. Uh, and all I did was just, what I actually did was I just started going bushwalking and, and I started sort of basically disappearing into the rainforest. And so I wasn't really, I wasn't really tackling the, the, the diagnosis per se. I was avoiding it. And, um, and, and as a result of going on sick leave and not working and, and I, this is when I really started to isolate myself, I started to go downhill even further and the fact that I was isolating myself not working I'd lost that structure of work my work day uh my brain now was freed up even was was quite mm -hmm. free the, the the traumatic memories really started to bubble up and this just made me worse uh and so I found myself actually having more nightmares more mm -hmm. flashbacks mm -hmm. and completely confused as to why this was going on why this was happening and that's when I got to the point of um of being suicidal because the the pain of all this just was was insurmountable Mary was trying to get me into crisis programs on the mainland that were were just booked out for months uh she was trying to get me into a psychologist who specialized in this and of course there were just no resources in Tasmania for this sort of thing um and eventually I, I got to the point where I was suicidal and Mary said, you need to be hospitalized. You know, you've reached that, you've reached that point of despair. Yeah. Mm. And that was, that was, that was sort of, I guess that was the turning point really when I realized I was in crisis and I needed to tackle this thing. Yeah. And, I, and that's I, when you accepted to go to um, sign yourself into Ward 17, wasn't it? Correct. Mm. Yeah. I, at the time, was working with um, refugees and asylum seekers, and um, I began to notice that these people who'd been through extreme events, there was some sort of correlation between what was happening in my home and mm. what had happened to these people um, and, and the sort of trauma and, and the nightmares, yeah. um, the uh, avoidance, um, and... Yeah, I, I think that um, at the time was um, really gave me an insight. Yeah, it certainly sounds like your new role, your new work role, Mary, supporting refugees mm -hmm. and with along with the obvious education you must have had at that time of understanding trauma and major events and being much yes. more fluent in that language of psychological mm -hmm. safety and trauma would have allowed you to see parallels between your yes. husband and your patients or your clients. Um, how, Dean, you speak, you write absolutely brilliantly in your memoir about each of your psych admissions. And it's it's almost like you're a different person each time you go. Yes. I, I, I remember vividly from, I, I read it several months ago, but I do remember vividly the sort of initial Oh, I don't need to be here. I'm better than all these people. Oh, what am I doing in the loony bin kind of attitude to yeah. just being a completely different person at the end where you just, what came across was your gratitude for having met all, every single person, patient or clinician in the ward and sort of realizing your place in the world. Um, you, you mentioned, so you mentioned that you had been through taking a sick leave from work you had yep. started isolating yourself and escaping into the bush one of the questions that has come through is what do you think would have happened if you'd continued working instead would that have been better or worse uh if i'd have kept working nothing would have changed I, I would not have i would not have been able to uh actually tackle the core issues that i was having around the trauma that i was going through and i think eventually um 
I think things would have come to a head with Mary and I. Uh, things would have, our, our marriage would have completely ruptured. Um, I may have ended up living down in the, in the back paddock. Um, in all seriousness, I may have just had a complete breakdown uh, without any, any um, clinical support whatsoever. Going on leave was important because I needed to address the core issue of my trauma. The problem was I went on leave without the clinical supports around me. Mm -hmm. And that was partly because I live in a state without much clinical support. But the other problem and the critical issue here is I went on leave without any employer support. Okay, I had zero, virtually zero support from my employer when I went on leave. I was basically left without any, my employer Reuters uh, did not virtually left me for dead. And Sounds like and you I felt out of sight, out of mind. Completely. I was basically treated like damaged goods. And I think this is one of the lessons from my book that all media organizations can learn from is that when you have a journalist who goes on sick leave for whatever reason, you have to you have to look after them. And I basically was left for dead. And not only was that not good for my treatment and for my recovery, it made me feel worthless. Mm -hmm. And that actually contrib that contributed to my spiral downward. Mm -hmm. Because when you have given your whole life to an organization and you've risked your life for an organization, when you feel worthless, it contributes to your sense of worthlessness. And that that actually that played into my that played into my eventually that played into my suicidality. Yeah. Um, and and Mary, Mary watched this helpless in a way. And I even had my closest friend who worked at Reuters try to reach out to the organization, to the, the to the senior leaders of the organization to try to, to get them to intervene, and they did not. So um the fact that the fact that I had gone on on leave was a good thing to begin with because I had to stop work, I had to do something, but I was not taken care of, and that was wrong. An, an awful lot of journalists see their work as their primary purpose in life, and mm. I can imagine that stopping work was not only you know losing your structure, but losing your purpose, yeah. and then losing. I've I hear a lot of journalists who've had to quit either through trauma or through um, being persecuted and having to relocate losing their sense of self in a very big way because they've lost their 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 purpose in life and their driving force which has been their journalism which for most people is a vocation a really deep vocation mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. the what i find so i cannot you know you've just verbalized incredibly eloquently there dean what happened to you mentally and to and the process of the trauma making taking over making you feel worthless as a result of your employer not reaching out not checking in on you did you you've just expressed that really eloquently there now but at the time were you aware of what was going on inside of how of these of this kind of you know of series of events that were making you more ill i knew my i knew my identity was at stake clotilde i knew that my identity as a journalist was at stake because i knew deep down that i could not do this journalism anymore i knew when i went on sick leave that i would never be a reuters journalist anymore i'm getting goosebumps thinking about it now actually dean um mm. our house was um Dean was in a dark room most most of the day in bed. He'd occasionally get up for a little while, um, throw into the mix three young, very boisterous children, very close in age, um, who were always told, you know, and, and a dog that barked, um, you know, shh, daddy's sleeping. Uh, and they were sort of thinking, well, daddy's always sleeping. Mm. Um Yep. It, it, yeah, it, it was just, it, it, when I look back on it, I think, gosh, how did we get through it? But I know that around that time, um, the risk of suicide was very, very strong uh, because yeah. Dean 
couldn't see a way out. And also he felt, because he had this feeling of damaged goods, he started to feel, oh, I'm no good for my family and my family's no good for me. And that's... I am, but they're better off without me, which is what suicide yes, does. Yes. And that is yep. so dangerous. And Very dangerous. And then the isolation. And that is when I, I called Dean's closest friend and said, look, you, you need to come down here because we need to work out what to do. And yeah. Um, yeah, if it hadn't have been for Ward 17, um, I, I don't know where we'd be. I, I know that we would have got through because we're that, those sort of people, you know, we're determined, but. Yeah, that, Thank I, you. That, I, don't, I don't know why that emotion came from, but it was just, yeah, it was just about, you know, we're talking about what it means to be a journalist, right? And I just felt that emotion because I was thinking back to what it was like in 2016, what it was like for me when I knew I would never be mm. a Reuters journalist again. Yeah. Because I knew I could not do that job again because of my mm. PTSD. Mm. And and that's how much it meant to me to not yeah. be able to do the job I had done so successfully for so long mm. with, with such wonderful people around the world. Yeah. And... When that, when you know that that job is no longer going to be available to you because of the trauma that you've suffered, it really takes a chunk out of you. Mm. And then when you're, when you just are not quite sure how you're going to get out of that hole, um, yeah, you end up in a very dark place. And uh, and that that I think that that speaks to the identity of a journalist. Yeah. You live journalism so mm. fully. It is not a job because you go away into that environment most of the time and you are reporting and you're living together um, yeah. with each other, you know, a group of journalists 24 hours a day. Sometimes you are closer to them than your own family. Um, so to lose all that, you're not just losing your job, oh. you're losing your identity, your friends, your, your life, your future, oh. your life. But I, yeah. It's hard explain that to people but i think, I, think what I, I don't want people i don't want people watching this to think that you can never be a journalist again because as no, I, as the book as i say in the book i later discovered years later that i could still be a journalist mm -hmm. just in a different way yeah. right so being doing podcasts mm -hmm. doing longer form journalism i writing a book or you know writing opinion pieces mm -hmm. i just couldn't do news agency journalism again mm -hmm. you know when well, i me, when i became when i became absolutely. the head of mental health at reuters so I was actually asked if I wanted to go back to Baghdad and I said, I could not do that. I could not. The stress would kill me. Mm, yeah. But, you know, my message for people out there who are journalists who are struggling with PTSD or other forms of trauma is, yeah, you can still do journalism. And 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 I think if you if you get on top of your trauma early enough, you can still do the journalism you, you have been doing for years. Mm. You just got to get that treatment early enough. Don't leave it like I did. And deal with it too late that was my problem mm. do you think that's interesting that you say you dealt with it too late i would say you didn't because you're still here and you're still together with me well, okay now that's a good yeah no, that is true time. that is true yeah. yeah that is true yeah but this this i i think it's a very reassuring comment that you make about journalists being able to continue as journalists even if they can no longer operate in a war zone or a hostile environment because of the impact of having done that for too long i yeah. i think the best description of trauma management i've read is one that says or it's a description of resilience rather if you want to be a resilient a resilient journalist and work at the peak of your performance you must build in periods of recovery and yes. so even Olympic athletes who are the highest performers in their field have recovery built into their training. It's, in, it's unfathomable that an Olympic athlete would perform at their best without these periods of downtime. Yeah. You know, it's a wave. You can't operate at your peak without having lots of periods in the trough where you recover and rest. And I often find that that's, particularly um, a problem for freelance journalists, but journalism in, in, in general doesn't allow for that because the news, the, the news Correct. cycle dictates, 
especially now with 24 hour news rolls and journalists being asked to deliver more for less with less support, the pressures are unbelievably high. Mm. And I don't think that the industry itself has caught up with what is humanly reasonable <laughs> to expect. Mm. And I wonder if it's just un unreasonable or unrealistic to think somebody could operate at the level you were operating at as, you know, a demonstrably very successful foreign correspondent and then bureau chief for more than five to 10 years. I mean, the idea that anybody could operate at that level for more than 10, 15 years seems ludicrous to me. We don't, we don't even expect footballers to operate at that level for more than 15 years. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of accepted yeah. in other areas that if you're going to perform at that peak, you're going to have to, you know, cut it out at some point. The other thought I, what you said brought to mind is that at its heart, journalism is really about storytelling. And there is a huge amount of storytelling that is necessary and a hundred and different ways of using those storytelling skills that don't need to expose you to trauma. Yes. But you can also repurpose that exposure to trauma in a really positive way and support others as you have decided to do. And, you know, if people look into trauma, there is also post-traumatic growth, which you touch on in your book. There's an off, you know, it's not the end of the road, but I think I wonder if your emotional moment was just then was just recognizing the part of you that had, that died. I think there's a grief. So. There. There's yeah. a part of, you know, you're a different person now. Yeah. I don't want to like get all mystical and say, well, you were reborn no, in no, quarantine, no. but th yeah. there is a death, isn't there? You have to accept oh. Oh. Part grief. of you is gone. Yes, yes. There was just yeah. a bit of grief. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm now, I, I'm a peer worker at a mental health clinic, uh, which I've just started, where I started work recently. And I, I love the work. It's very meaningful. But I think there was just a bit of grief for that mm -hmm. old yeah. news agent. Your old journalist. self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So in the, Mary, I was touched by your very vivid description there of how tough it was in your home life with your three little kids and your husband who needed to be in a dark room, not have any loud noises. There's a very evocative chapter title in um, Dean Yates's memoir called Eggshells, which is what yes. it sounds like you were describing. Yes. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the eggshells. Is that is that a telltale sign for, for spouses or oh. families that their partner might be experiencing PTSD? And how how do you deal with that as as a loved you know as the loving partner of someone with PTSD who might not quite recognize what they're struggling with, who might be buried in work. I mean, the, the classic story I've come across is the journalists are fine when their adrenaline is pumping and they're telling the story or they're on the job. And then when they go home, that's when it all collapses. Oh, yes. Nothing was more um, descriptive, really, and more fitting than talking about walking on eggshells. Um, and I, I still don't really understand why that phrase, because it is so apt why it's just sort of so triggering in yeah. a way um but i suppose it does just encompass everything really um walking on eggshells you know crack 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 um it, it just says it all i'm breaking i'm breaking everything every step i i take um and when i would talk to people um you know through my job um who'd experienced trauma they would talk about walking on eggshells um I almost thought the, the book should be called <laughs> Walking on Eggshells. I, I wanted to shout that um, because, yeah, um, it, it just is one of those phrases that, you know, I'm walking on eggshells. Um, I, I suppose I wasn't ever really expecting the reaction I got the first time I said it, um, but it does really encapsulate. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious for Dean to say um when I first used that phrase I think it brought everything to a head and I suddenly realized whoa I wish I could just take that back but yeah what it, did it's... it mean to you to hear your partner say we're walking on eggshells yeah I, I just lost it when Mary said that to me one night because uh to me and I can I can look back now mm. because I've had time to think about 
what it what that word means but it was like it was it was like saying uh to 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 me and it was it was me basically thinking i'm no good to my family if if my family are walking on eggshells around me that i'm no good to them mm. and and what was really telling was in my very first group session in ward 17 uh, on my first admission the word came up and i'm sitting in a room with coppers and veterans all men about 10 of us and the word came up and everyone in that room said yep it's like that at home everyone feels like their partners are walking on eggshells and on one hand it was like oh my god these guys are just like me mm. their homes are just like mine and so that was that sort of validation that it wasn't just me mm. uh i i was i was like them and i realized then that this was this this trauma thing was was universal mm. and it, it gave me an understanding of of just how destructive ptsd was but i i think it um it also helped me understand how important it was to work really hard on on managing my symptoms understanding my anger understanding my agitation because of the effect it had on my family mm -hmm. and uh because i think at the end of the day that was that's what drives families apart it's what breaks up the relationships is because you become as as you're impossible to live with if your family yeah. are walking on eggshells yeah absolutely yeah I'd like to um, expand on what you just said about the, the universality of trauma. It, I think this is, the, this is one thing that really touched me in the book. When, when you first sent me the, the manuscript, it wasn't packaged in this beautiful cover. <laughs> and I remember, just because I was coming to it from a journalism point of view, imagining it being sold as a sort of, you know, journalist's story um and i was quite surprised when your your publishers decided to package it like this and then now of course i've got used to it and i can see the wisdom in what they've done they've universalized the story yes. which i think is genius because in fact what you're talking about the the impact on the families is very very similar for anyone struggling with trauma and ptsd no matter how they experienced it I've never I've never actually reported from a war zone or a conflict zone, but I grew up in a household with a mother who was diagnosed with PTSD. She she also wasn't a journalist or had any experience, similar experience, but the impact is the same. And so to re it's not just the a journalist problem. It's not just mm. the duty of care of an employer to their employees. It's just the the management of the society of our health as a whole the knock-on effect is just so huge you know the, um family breakup is always cited as a a real cause for so society's problems and you know the lack of strong um bonds and human bonds and the growing rates of loneliness so i just see it all as being tied in together and Mary, you must have seen lots of parallels between how you were trying to support refugees and what Dean was trying to do with helping people come to terms with how they were dealing with their trauma. That It sounds like um, the familiarity with that trauma landscape helped you, made sense of your home life. Um, was there... Anything else that helped you cope with the difficulties in your marriage at that time? I mean, frankly, some of the episodes in the book just made me think, God, you know, anyone else would have been out of there. Mm. Um, I, I had also worked in family violence. Um, so I knew that you didn't have to go to war to be in a war zone, that a war zone could be next door. It could be in your own home. So um I, I had done, you know, I'd worked in a women's refuge. Um, so I, I knew, I thought I knew a lot. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, what was your I think, I think, having, I think 
your close friendships really helped you as well, didn't they? The, the supports that you had with our close friends. Yes. You know, one of the things that um, one of the things that really helped Mary was out, we had we had some really close friends, and Mary was able to have close conversations with them without me. Yeah. And they were an amazing support um, mm. to Mary that she could just ch uh, channel her. Mary was able to channel her frustrations and, and anger mm. to them. Mm without me present, whether it was WhatsApp conversations mm. or face, they would come and visit us. But also you still had to put on this persona when you mm. went to work, when you were with, with a lot of other different people that, um, because you wanted to be the same. You didn't want to be the woman who lived in a domestic war zone whose husband was ill and um, you didn't want to be that either. Um, so, gosh, you know, um, it, it's a long time since it happened, but it still feels like yesterday. Um, Especially when we're, when because it took seven years to write the book, so I'd sometimes go to Mary and say, can we just talk about that time when, and... And I'd be like, no, it didn't happen like that. Yes, and, <laughs> and so that resulted in... Yeah. I, I guess we would sometimes have different versions of events, which would which was interesting, um, and would, uh, but that was just, that was, that was... I guess that's how you have different memories of things, right? I'd remember it from my perspective. Mary yeah. would remember it from her perspective. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because Dean's written a book about a war zone and trauma in a war zone, but we are learning more and more about the war zones mm -hmm. in our own communities. And yeah. I hope that the parallels there are not lost. Yeah. Um, so many of us have experienced childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know childhood trauma stays with you for the rest of your life it shapes you and yeah. I hope that people who have experienced childhood trauma or any sort of trauma are able to get something from this book because I think it really speaks to that as well you know that having to um you know try and be tough um I, I think that people are only just starting to speak in the past you know few years about childhood trauma um yeah. we're starting to have these conversations um, I, 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 and people are also just starting to speak about generational trauma yes. which of course both yes. of which are inextricably linked with war zones war zones create childhood trauma and generational trauma and i i was at a very interesting workshop recently where some a, a journalist who started out his life um as a soldier and then became a journalist after the war in bosnia they're now 20 years after the war still struggling with the fallout yeah. and inviting journalists from countries currently in conflict to come and report from the future as he says by seeing what's happening in bosnia when 20 years later the war criminals have done their time they're out of prison they're now back in the society how the heck do you handle all that no, yeah. you know, you've got to live with them so yeah. the trauma trauma certainly does i mean i think it's encouraging to see how much more education and understanding there is about trauma in different places areas of life um what i would be what we hear regularly at the royal pack trust with journalists applying for us to um applying to us for support grants to pay for therapy we we have a support fund where we can give journalists grants to start them off on therapy and start them on the road and cover three months of treatment so that they can see whether it works for them and what surprised us is that initially we thought journalists would come to us with their chosen therapist and just we would help with the financial burden. Journalists don't know how to find a therapist and they're screaming out for educated clinicians yep. who understand the world of journalism, the profession, the pressures of the newsroom and all of that. Like you said, Dean, doing 24 hour news is not, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very different place to be. It's probably more yep. akin to I don't know, we're, you know, to first responders, really, yeah. um, and that kind of pressure. And, you know, they've a lot of journal. It's interesting that you said earlier, your first 
experience of a psychiatrist didn't work so well for you and you had to keep right. going until you found the right one and I think that's a really important message to remind people mm. just because yeah. it you don't find the silver bullet in your first meeting yeah. with a psychiatrist don't give up you know if you've looked into this path there must be a reason something is leading mm. you to getting help just keep mm. going until you find the right support and luckily yeah. there are fantastic initiatives in America and through the Dart Center where they are educating clinicians in understanding the role of journalists and how journalists work and operate and what makes them tick. And we've um, at the Roy Pack Trust gathered quite a large pool of clinicians that understand journalists, which is great. Um, Mary, you said, I, I can't help but think that one of the great advantages that your couple had was that you understood journalism you'd been there you'd done the journalism yourself not just as a as a day-to-day -day journalist but reporting from um hostile environments yourself and conflict zones yourself did you feel that that gave you an advantage for dean did that help save your marriage if you like yes because i think it, in his eyes i was able to speak the language i needed to and i had the credibility also because I had been in conflict zones. Um, I had taken risks. I'd been a freelancer. Um, so I was able to turn around and say, you know, I've been there. And mm. and also I I had recognised the symptoms myself. Mm. Um, sometimes I think if you're a freelancer, you're working twice as hard because you want to be hired again for the next story. Um, so I was coming home from long stretches away so um I, I felt that I did have some credibility there to be able to say look I I know there is something yeah. wrong he um, wasn't able to say you just don't understand oh yes no he was so <laughs> <laughs> but I I was able to counter that you know okay I hadn't been in you know a war in, in the war in Iraq or in Aceh but trauma is trauma and yeah. um and you had, you had significant experience working with cameramen from who'd covered the war in Bosnia, oh, for example. Yes. And... yes, and I'd seen how traumatised they were. Um, I Yeah, and um, I, I could see that sort of self-destruction yeah. uh, around me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the self-destruction is is definitely a pattern. I'd, I'd like to ask you, Dean, Having come through, there's two things I'd like to ask. One is to expand a bit on your recovery. It's very, mm. very clear from your book um, that trauma recovery is not um, a, a, a one-way street. Yep. It's not a straight line. It's not incremental. It's very much a wiggly a line full of ups and downs and, and you know, resets. Um, how do you feel now? Where are you at now? Oh, look, I, I, I think um, my journey has, has has involved a lot of highs and lows, but I wouldn't I wouldn't even qualify for a PTSD diagnosis anymore, put it that way. Uh, that's that's where I'm at. I'm able to now work as a peer worker in a mental health clinic and sit with people who are going through suicidal distress. That's where I'm at right now. And I am able to hold space for them and and give them and try and help them manage that crisis i'm not a clinician but i can sit with them and i can help give them some support and then guide them give them some guidance and help them into a, a referral process that we have at this particular clinic where i live um i feel that um where i'm at has been a long journey but one that um, has resulted in the post-traumatic growth that you you spoke about, and I feel that uh, the relationships I have in my life with my with Mary, with my kids, with my friends, and so on, are so much deeper, and the meaning I get out of my life is so much richer. So it's uh, I, I'm I, I feel very very lucky and very privileged. The human connections I have in my life are so much deeper. Mm -hmm. But it's taken a lot of hard work and it's taken a, and, and this, there are a lot of deep scars there fulfilled as well as a result of that. Um, but that's a very encouraging message to others that mm. may be struggling that it's mm. worth the hard work. 
You got to no work harder. One's, no one's it's, saying no, it's easy, no, no, no. Yeah, but you can recover from T PTSD. Yes. I think there's a little bit more understanding of it now, but I I think um, previously people would have thought, oh, he's got PTSD. Well, that's it. No, his days yeah, are yeah, yeah. like you said, damage. I, I, I say this all the time to people. I wouldn't qualify for a PTSD diagnosis anymore. So there's no there's no cure. You can still have P I can still have PTSD symptoms. Like I might still have a nightmare or something like that, but I wouldn't qualify for a diagnosis anymore. Mm. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a message in that you can recover. You and can recover. Mm. Absolutely. That, um, once there is a diagnosis of PTSD, don't don't throw people out. Yeah, exactly. Don't push That's... them into workers' compensation. Yep. Right. People, Dean is demonstrating mm. now have such um mm. you know have such power in our communities to sit with yeah. people who are well, you know as we're always saying trauma is trauma dean is sitting with people um you know three days a week yep. of people who have experienced all sorts of trauma but yeah. he's still able to talk to them because mm. it's trauma it doesn't matter yeah. you know yeah. whether you've never left your home town yeah. um <laughs> you're, you're, you're leading me to my next question mary which was going to be yeah. to ask dean if he yeah. felt he could do his current job without having experienced ptsd no 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 i, I couldn't i wouldn't even qualify i wouldn't actually have been interviewed for the job if i didn't have ptsd because mm. the the job requirement actually was to have been to have actually been in suicidal crisis to mm. actually Experience. To have lived experience of mental illness and to have had and been in suicidal crisis, that is actually a job requirement, which I think, which I think is this is progress, right? Yeah, yeah, to have, absolutely. To have, roles, to have roles for people like this, because yep. in the short time that I've been in this job, people have said to me, "So what? What have you experienced?" And I've told them, and they're like, "Oh, okay, you get it." Yeah. I like to ask a question though: in journalism, why can we not? you know, harness this lived experience yeah. for younger journalists. That would just, you know. I think it's amazing. essential. I, th yeah. I think it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's essential. Brilliant. Dean, uh, earlier in our conversation, you experienced a little moment of grief for who you were mm. before. Um, because we we said journalists often for journalists, their job is their sense of purpose, their purpose in life and their vocation. Have you recovered a sense of purpose now? Oh, I can feel it. I can feel it. Absolutely. I love what I'm doing already in this new role. Um, and I I can't wait to get, I can't wait to go back in again and, and start another day. And I look forward to whoever I might meet and, and how can I help them? That's what I'm thinking. How can and I help that person? Could you have imagined being where you are now at the beginning of in, in that during that first um time the, the first admittance to ward 17 never no i wouldn't have even i was it was life was such a fog then there was no tomorrow there was no it, it was just being in that fog of ptsd there was no future um and that's what going towards 17 gave me it helped it helped clear that fog away helped me understand what i needed to do it gave me the tools to tackle ptsd gave me the strategies gave me an understanding gave me hope and and these were clinicians there who wanted to take that journey with me and they opened their hearts to me and they talked to Mary this was the other thing about it right these folks actually called Mary and said tell us about Dean we want to know what's going on we want to involve you in his treatment mm. that was critical as well mm. yeah absolutely that must have made you feel supported as well Mary yes and I felt heard yep it, it was yep. Great, because I did have a whole level of experience that maybe they weren't seeing. And I knew that Dean was very good at presenting a front. Mm. Um, so I wanted to make sure that, you yeah. know, the old mask <laughs> slipped off. And... <laughs> yes. Well, I'm re I'm, I, I think it's wonderful to um, come to the end of this discussion with a message of hope and a message of your post um post-traumatic growth, Dean, and your new sense of purpose and your new role and recognising that you couldn't have had this really beneficial contribution in society without having experienced your difficulties as a result of your previous role. Um, I'm just going to check if there are any 
questions from any attendees that um, any of the OPC team might want to put forward. I've picked up on a few as we were going through. Oh yes, there is one about the, the duty of care we mentioned. And Mary was pointing out that there's a lot of knowledge and lived experience that could be really beneficial to prepare the next generation of journalists and protect them in the future. Um, we're quite, I'm very interested in this at the Rory Pack Trust. We've actually launched a series of in-person events um, at the Frontline Club in London. And next Wednesday, we'll be having a conversation about the psychological toll of journalism. Um, what, what we've seen is actually that the younger generation are asking a lot more questions. Okay. They're much more um, comfortable with the language of mental health. They are asking their few potential employers, well, you know, what's the work rhythm? What are the support um, mechanisms in place? Did you, do you know what, um, what the situation is now at Reuters? Do they have programs now that support journalists? Have they come around in the end to some of your recommendations that you tried to put in place when you were first setting up a mental health program at the uh, at the company? Well, I wasn't my my I wasn't replaced when I left. Uh, and the anecdotal evidence the anecdotal evidence I have from people who still work at Reuters is that uh, no, um, the the efforts that I I tried to make to have the mental health of Reuters journalists a pillar, an absolute priority of the organisation is not the case, which disappoints me greatly. I think Reuters had an opportunity to actually set the global benchmark for journalists' mental health, and I think they failed. And, they, and I think that was a great shame. It's a, it's a great, it's a, it's a massive loss of opportunity. And I just hope another media organisation out there does try to set the standard, whether it's the BBC, whether it's CNN or the New York Times. I just hope another organisation does that because journalists are suffering and they need someone to show leadership, real leadership on this to make they, journalists' mental health an absolute priority. They certainly do. And I, I can... Um... Assert, I, I can attest to the fact that I've spoken to a lot of young journalists who I think are going to vote with their feet. And if yes. you want to attract the best talent in the future, you're going to have to run healthy newsrooms because people won't, they, they won't want to sacrifice everything that was expected of your generation to do the job. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Mm. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was such a pleasure to speak with both of you. Thank you so much for sharing, Mary, how what it was like, um, the difficulties of living with a partner struggling with trauma. I think the that's what's so tricky about trauma. There's a massive ripple effect throughout families, throughout communities, et cetera. And like you say, trauma is trauma. Doesn't There's all sorts of different ways that you can come across it. And we all need to become much more comfortable with talking about it. And I just cannot recommend Dean's memoir um, enough. It's a wonderful, wonderful read. It's very touching, very open. It's very clear Mary helped Dean share mm -hmm. his human, his humanity in the book. It's a fantastic read and a, a really, really good, hopeful um book for anyone dealing with any of these problems who who wants to be able to have some help putting these things into words which so often is the struggle thank you so much thank you oh, thank, thank you, you very you. much for, for hosting us okay. thank you yes thank you to opc as well thank you patricia thank you overseas press club goodbye thank everyone thank goodbye. you very much it was a wonderful program thank you thank you